Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I welcome all of you back to another Chris Shan quickie reading. And today, ladies and gentlemen, marks a fairly significant occasion because I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but it's been roughly 13 years since uh, Robert uh, Franklin Chandler Jr. passed away. And it would have made him somewhere near 97 if he were still alive this year. I'm not entirely sure how Bob would have taken the, what Chris has been doing, uh, well, of, of lately, but this is more here to talk about uh, the big man himself. Now, a lot of people have given him various nicknames over the years, from the internet lumberjack to Chris Chan's father to simply Bob Chandler. So, well, here we go. So, here it is. It was an interesting life I had. Bob at peace and this was him in discussion with uh, when Chris was taking Emily out for a day back in 2009. I had more freedom when he was alive, Chris reflecting on his life prior to his father's death. Also, I believe he ever, Mr. C, any of her past boyfriends, ex-husbands, haven't really re reached her with their well, by the way, this is Chris honouring Bob's memory by claiming that he was somehow better at giving it to his own wife than he ever was. What an absolute... Well, yeah, you, you can fill out the rest. Um, that's just, like... It, it just goes to... Love, it, it goes to show you how much Chris really did, like, respect his father. And we will get to more of that later. And here it is. Here, well, he, 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 here he is, the big man himself. Robert Bob Franklin Chandler Jr. was born on the 4th of September 1927 and died the 6th of September 2011. Was the father of Christian Weston Chandler, Carol Chandler and David Allen Chandler. He was also the stepfather of Cole Smithy and husband of Barbara Weston Chandler. Bob became a firm favourite with trolls due to Chris's uh, an antiphy... Uh, antipathy uh, towards him and for his infamous cameo when he walked in on Chris mass d baiting his nickname the internet lumberjack came from this supposed incident well I say supposed we, we knew it was happened <laughs> wherein he promised to cut the internet down I wish to this day Robert had done but we all know uh, that was sadly not to be despite being estranged from his own children or his other children, and despised by his stepson for his rather abusive behaviour, Bob was widely viewed as a better parent than his wife Barbara by Christorians. And, as far as Chris's own testimony can be trusted, he treated Chris better than any of his previous children. This was due in the fact that both Bob and Bob saw Chris as uh, a chance to start again. If only... Bob had serious difficulties working with Chris's autism, a disorder that he and his wife did not fully understand, but nonetheless, he had high hopes for his child in spite of the difficulties that he faced. Bob hoped to instill Chris with a variety of interests that reflected his own varied tastes, and he created the Dreaming Studio in their backyard in the hopes that they create things there, though sadly, nothing of notice was ever created there. Barbara... Be well, because of this, Bob's personality and popularity stems from being somewhat concerned with Chris's foolish behaviour, and the fact that he occasionally tried to encourage a modicum of responsibility in Chris's sorry life, bringing up the fact that he devoted 29 years to raising his son. Of course, Chris was almost entirely unaffected by Bob's efforts to better him, but unlike Bob, he at least made the effort, even if his attempts were futile or harmful at worst. That being said, he also encouraged Chris n to not seek employment in favour of getting welfare, even though Chris could still hold a part-time job and receive those benefits. So he's not entirely blameless for the sorry state that his son is in today, either. Um, not to mention that many of Chris's more backward social perspectives that he had in the classic era stem from his influence. Bob was always eager to chat, and indeed, much of the known information about Bob's life comes from conversations he had with trolls. It seems that Chris's passion for honest content did not fall far too far from the tree, although Bob at least had a filter that his son lacks. 
where in person, or whether in person or over the phone, Bob appeared to relish the opportunity to speak with just about anyone. That poor man. According to Chris, he was also a strong negotiator. On the 6th of September 2011, Bob died of complications from heart failure at Martha's and Jefferson Hospital ICU, surrounded by his family, his pastor and hospital staff. He was survived by his wife and son, who then had to become the man of the house. Chris occasionally raked in some income through commission work, though he was never looked for a serious career. Chris initially came to terms with his father's deaths in a con conventional healthy way, but eventually turned to a coping mechanism where he genuinely believed that his father was alive in another dimension, as a sonichu named Robert Chu. Years later, in 2021, Chris would disgrace Bob's memory by repeatedly uh, cuckolding his own father by having dubiously consensual sex with his wife in an incest-based affair, with Chris bragging that he could get Bob off better than Mr. C ever could. Following this incident, both were separated from the house that he maintained, with Chris jailed, Bob temporarily hospitalised, before eventually returning to the residence, and the Dreaming Studio left abandoned. And that's just the introduction. So, if you, while we're probably going to be having our little uh, "Who do you think you are?" moment, I am going to shut the window because I can, if I can hear the breeze, I, I think you guys can probably hear it as well. So, I'll just do this as well. Also, I should point out is that I did originally want to do this article probably somewhere closer to Father's Day. But then I kind of thought to myself is that you don't really need a special day to show your appreciation or loved ones to the people you love. You should just get up and do it for even for estranged parents and estranged children. It's 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 a very situational based sort of thing, but that's how that is. Biography. Bob was born at 4.15 p.m. at a medical arts building in Fort Worth, Texas, and raised in Sayacuga, Alabama. He was the only child of Robert Franklin Bobby Chandler Sr., born the 8th of February 1906 and died the 27th of December 1977, an, an Alabamian insurance agent and Gene Holloman from the 28th of March 1906 to the 10th of May 1945, a Texan housewife. Bob was eight young, has Bob has eight younger half siblings on his father's side. He also mentioned having a cousin and several Cherokee relatives in Oklahoma. However, a distant relative disputed his Cherokee heritage, and his son's DNA tests in 2018 believed any American Indian descent. It is common to, uh, for white southerners to make dubious claims to Cherokee ancestry for a variety of historical reasons. Bob has said he was interested in the world around him since he was 10 years old and began collecting foreign stamps as a child in the 1930s. His first stamp was of Michael I of Romania. He also developed an interest in foreign music, eventually collecting some 15,000 to 20,000 LPs from various genres and cultures. About 100 or so survived the 2014 house fire. Bob joined the Boy Scouts, becoming an Eagle Scout and a Scoutmaster for over 20 years. According to Chris, Bob lost his virginity at the age of 27, which could have been in 1954 or 1955. I am slightly um, curious about why Chris needed to know about when his own dad lost his virginity. Oh, and by the way, this was Bob in 1942, so he would have been... Um, I, I promise I'm good at math. Let me just... Uh, let, let, me do, let me do this properly, okay? I'm, I'm, I'll just... Uh, so, 1927, so let's see... Five... Uh, so, what, so, what would... So he would have been 15 years old when he was uh, dressed as this. And also, this is Bob Chandler on the left as a Boy Scout in 1945. 40 would have been a little bit taller, but uh, never mind. Service and education. A 1942 yearbook from a Sekugia High School lists as a Bobby Chandler in the freshman class and glee club. 
suggesting that he graduated from his school in spring of 1945 before uh, matriculating at Auburn University as an aeronautical engineer majoring that autumn. Bob apparently had knowledge th that the army desired, was conscripted as a special draftee in 1946 and placed in the Signal Corps. There he learned how to install valve systems, switchboards and telephones. After basic training and signal school in Fort uh, Monmouth, or Monmouth, New in <laughs> let me try this again. After basic training and signal school in Fort uh, Monmouth, New Jersey, Bob was sent to Korea for a year to install infrastructure with the American Occupation Force. Serving until 1948, he was entitled to the World War II Victory Medal. His service number was 44107856. Figuring he'd get swallowed up at a big college, Bob picked a small college, Jacksonville State Teachers College, now Jacksonville State University. After leaving the military, he studied pre-engineering and joined the band there for two years before returning to Auburn University, where he studied electri electrical engineering and graduated in 1952 with a Bachelor of Electrical Engineering degree. As an engineer, he never learned to spell properly. While he was at Auburn, he was part of the band once again, was a member of the Wesley Foundation, a United Methodist religious group, and Phi Mu Alpha, a social frat dedicated to men who are interested in music. Not bad. I wonder if generally if when uh, uh, Mr. C was in Korea, it's when he, his uh, fascination with music uh, first came about. It might have also been because um, I, I know that it's sort of like... Uh, I don't. I don't know. It might have. It might have been due. Maybe part and due with when uh, Japanese uh, influence uh, came into Korea during like the earlier twentieth century. If there was some like um, there was some like well, culture was like left in Korea by the Japanese, or it's it's. So, I think it's something like that. I'm. Don't quote me on any of this, by the way. This is only like a wild assumption, I suppose. Uh, by the way, Bob served in Korea and thankfully for Chris, who believes that he was a sperm carried in one of his father's testicles. During that time, he left before the Korean War broke out. Now, fair enough, so because the Korean War began in 1950, if my memory serves me correctly. Korea. A 1946 military record included Bob's occupation while he was a student at Tinsmith, Coppersmith and Sheet Metal Worker. Bob worked for Western Electric as an engineer for 40 years, where he designed a variety of electrical subsystems, including relays, telephones, and valve systems. During the 1950s, he lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where his father and half of his half-siblings lived for the rest of their lives. He was then offered a job by General Electric in Utica, New York. Since New York is too cold and a Yankee for Bob, he left after three years, returning back to Winston-Salem for a few years before transferring to Roanoke in southwest Virginia, where he discovered his love for the mountains. In 1975, he moved to Richmond, where he worked until 1980. When he was transferred to Charlottesville, he worked with both Goodrich and Goodyear. With, a, with General Electric, Bob was responsible for at least seven patterns. Bob claimed in an email to Miyamoto, that without Bob's influence in the computer world, the NES might never have arrived so soon. Ignoring the fact that the NES was designed and released in Japan in 1983 without influence from American electronics. Bob Chandler is one of the most creative engineers in the organization, the general manager at General Electric. That's quite, that's quite a claim and I think Mr. C must have been really proud of somebody saying that for him. Examples of Bob's accomplishments include an automated steel mill for rolling steel for cars, a paper mill for the production of Kleenex, warehousing, railroads, and tanker ships. He designed scooters, die casting machines, machines for producing plastic products, and a vehicle logging system. Both Chris and Barbara have bragged that Bob designed controls that were used in plastic water containing model for machines. Bob retired in 1987 at the age of 59 or 60. His relatively early retirement may have been provoked by health problems, as he writes in his December 1987 letter to Chris that, I know now that I, at best, haven't much time left to share myself with you. 
Bob himself was proud of his natural inclination for logic, although he was inordated. By all his designs, and whether he did well for the world, would plastic water bottles lead to mankind's salvation or utter destruction? Only time would tell. Still, with that being said, I think it's fair to say Bob did more than probably you and I probably will probably do in our lives. But hey, you know what? You never know these things, but world consciousness. I have been very interested in the world since I was 10 years old. And that was 70 years ago. And the uh, I'm very fond of all and I really truly believe in the United Nations. But you won't find anybody else in my countryside or around here, I think, that does. But anyway, I'm very world conscious. Bob referred to himself as a Republican, and he did not vote for Barack Obama in the 2008 presidential election. That said, he had misgivings about Bob McDonnell, the Republican candidate in the 2009 Virginia gubernatorial election, and the ultimate winner of the election possibly because of McDonald's support for very strict anti-abortion laws, which made no expectations for cases of rape or incest. Hmm. Bob and Chris considered writing in Snoopy for Peanuts as a protest vote. In a potentially damaging moment on the 18th of February 2009, Bob doubted the existence of Mulvania, Julia's country of origin, but he continued talking on the grounds that his grasp of post-Soviet geography was shaky. He apparently convinced himself that Mulvania was the same place as the real country of Moldova, a former Soviet republic located near the Black Sea. However, he rather damningly failed to question why Julie spoke perfect English with an American accent. Besides Korea, Bob also visited Australia and England at some point in his life. Relationships Previous Family Bob was previously married to a woman named Patricia Harley on the 25th of September 1956 at a United Methodist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They had two children, David Allen Chandler, born 1961, which would make him 63 as of the time of this writing, and Carol Suzanne Chandler, born 1966, making her 58 years old as of the time of writing. Bob and Patricia separated on the 28th of June 1976, before divorcing on the 28th of January 1980. Bob's relationships with David and Carol were strained in his later years. Because of this, Chris did not know he had a niece named uh, David via David named Savannah until she was 8 years old, and Bob's relationship with Carol was even more distant. According to Chris, Bob was always concerned about Carol. None of the Chandlers knew what was going on with her, and the last they had heard was that she was working for the federal government, implying that she did not show up to her father's funeral. David, on the other hand, did attend his father's funeral. Barbara Bob and Barbara met in 1979 in, at Maddie's Pub in Richmond, probably Matt's British pub in uh, Shoki Slip, where Bob was a singer along leader in the late 1970s. Barbara was there with a friend and Bob was singing. According to Chris, Bob claimed that Barbara did the pursuing. She chased him down the hallway, though Bob has disputed this. This version of events may be why Chris figured that he could get away with being passive in terms of courtship. In contrast, Cole's friend uh, Chuck uh, McGiggian, Mc Mc uh, uh, who worked at the pub as a bartender, has a vivid memory of them acting out as a couple of drunken losers. They got married in 1980, only months after Bob and Patricia had divorced. Bob later told Chris that she ultimately married Bob because he owned a house. According to Chris, Bob and Bob did not have sex for at least two decades before Bob's passing. They have been sleeping in separate rooms in the years leading up to his death. I don't really know what to say about that, but apart from the fact that maybe Bob just in his later years preferred the privacy, or maybe I will since think that it was simply because they knew too much about each other already to even look each other in the eyes when they were in bed together. Sad, but not a not, not an unheard of tale in my opinion. Cole. 
Bob married Barbara when her son Cole was nearly 17, around the time Cole left to lead his own life. Cole feels that Bob's bitterness ruined the relationship between himself and his mother. Cole said he would celebrate when that fuck Bob finally drops, but it is unknown if he did so. Cole said that he and Bob shared a mutual hatred, though there isn't any proof that Bob hated Cole, at the least it is certain that Bob knew Cole did not like him. Chris Get away from the internet, I'm cutting it down right now. Bob Chandler, the internet lumberjack. Bob's relationship with Chris, however, was rather complex. While Bob was considered to be a better parent than his wife Bob, he was by no means the good old pop-pop Chandler many thought he was. While Bob at least tried to help Chris, his attempts at doing so were either futile, misguided, or even harmful to Chris in the long term. When Chris was a boy, Bob encouraged him to learn more about the world and tried sharing his interests and hobbies, including engineering, geography, and stamp collecting. When Chris was seven, Bob converted a shed in the backyard of 14 Branch Lane Court, Court to a workshop where he and Chris could build things together, dubbing it the Dreaming Studio. Chris could not recall what they had built together when asked about it in the years following Bob's death. He and Bob had been using the space for hoard storage. Bob wished that Chris was more interested in the world. He tried to teach Chris about foreign geography such as Europe and Australia and figured correctly that Chris doesn't understand countries and continents beyond what he's seen on television and can only associate with the places he's physically been to in Virginia. Bob had difficulties understanding Chris's autism and didn't even bother getting Chris the help he desperately needed, likely due to his antiquated view of mental health institutions. Bob fought tooth and nail for years to keep Chris from getting the special education he needed to cope with the real world. It was the very reason why Bob rented a second home in Chesterfield County so Chris couldn't attend special classes that Green County recommended. When Chris entered Manchester High, Bob hired a bunch of girls to babysit Chris in a misguided attempt to socialise Chris. He let Chris believe that they were legit friends when they were only in it for their own game. Now, I'll just, I'll have to like, uh, just a uh, short time out here, I'll just say this for the record right now, is the fact that you could argue very much that uh, Bob was completely under the impression that it was these things were were, were so des designed as mental institutions bordering on asylums that circa something out of one flew over the cuckoo's nest that maybe Bob had some level of reservations about whether or not uh, his son really needed them or if Bob didn't it's it's such a it's such a difficult one to like discuss with. A certain degree of foreknowledge because you have to remember this was during the uh, the late 1980s and the early 90s the systems were probably n no never mind the systems probably the uh, the opinions and the views towards mental health were probably not quite the same as the ones we have in 2024 and well and again so I'm not necessarily. I'm not surprised that Bob, Bob in his age uh, by this point had his reservations. But what I do have my reservations about is why Bob thought it was a good idea to hire girls to pretend to be Chris's friend. I don't know exactly how much they were paid, but it's. I don't know how. I don't know exactly at what point. I think it was like 2013 when Chris finally became aware of this to light, but. It was all, but this was the sort of thing that was always going to cause problems. Sadly, Bob enjoyed collecting stamps as a boy growing up in the 1930s, and he continued to do so for several decades, with a focus on the United Nations and foreign countries, building a collection of stamp albums which he fixed six boxes. He taught Chris about his hobby, buying him a beginner's stamp album in 1992. Chris seemed to enjoy the hobby as well since he had many pages of stamps filled in. In Letters to Chris, written when Chris was a few years old, Bob gave Chris permission to pass along his various collections onto others after inheriting them. In 2017, Chris began selling pieces of the inherited stamp collection. 
Bob's pieces were decently priced, generally for $5 per set, though he tried to sell his own personal stamp album for $1,000. Bob's racist joke that Barack Obama would paint the White House black as soon as he became president influenced Chris to draw it in Sonichu issue 8. Chris's phobia of penises was apparently sparked from bar uh, barging into his parents' room when Bob had a habit of sleeping nude from the waist down. Chris was often, has often complained about stressful confrontations with his own father. Well, my father is a major stressor against me. Starts arguments, annoys me, rarely washes his hands after restroom breaks. Lord knows I've tried to encourage him to wash numerous times and rarely succeeded. Yes, now, if you don't mind me, I'm just going to sit in my dusty room where I can barely see the floor because of the mountains of junk. And, and again, this may have been 2008, but... Ten years later than this, Chris was already living in a house that was stinking from, you know, dog feces and cat feces and goodness knows what else. However, the many instances of Bob communicating with trolls show that he was genuinely pleasant and amicable, not at all inclined to start arguments as Chris asserts, as seen during the lead up to the fateful encounter between Emily. Chris and the man in the pickle suit. Bob seemed to be more happy to discuss stories with people, even those he hadn't seen or heard that much of. Robert Simmons V, who met Bob during his, his visit to Chris's church, conversed with him extensively, later saying that he was a really pleasant guy. The antagonism to which Chris refers was likely Bob attempting to constructively criticise Chris in order to better him, as Chris deeply resents being told what he does not want to hear. I mean, well, welcome to the real world, but also, it's not particularly that surprising coming from Chris either, so make of that what you will. But it is worth noting as well as that Chris would later go on to say that he had more freedom when his father was alive. I know it's foolish and ridiculous in many cases to say that, well, that's, that's how life is, and this is also what happens when you don't take on your father's advice. I mean... How many of you guys have ever, just a quick, again another quick break, but how many of you guys have ever seen the movie Boys in the Hood? You remember how uh, Furious Styles, you know, how his relationship with his son Trey was? You remember how um, a hard but fair uh, Furious was with his son? You know why he was doing that? Because he was making Trey understand, trying to make him understand about the importance of responsibility and being accountable in the real world, especially in a part of the world where crime is rampant, murders happen every day, and what happens if you simply become like everyone else? I know that, again, it's... You, I, I love that movie to death, and I probably might even just watch... I'll probably watch it again just to see Furious Styles at work, but it, it, it is what it is, eh? An example of this criticism was Bob telling Chris that since Bob had looked after Chris for 29 years, despite his childish and outrageous behaviour, Chris show, should show more gratitude towards him. Chris was completely dismissive, figuring that his father was obligated to take care of him, and seeing no reason as to why he should demonstrate any foreign concepts like love, support, gratitude, and willingness to help. Because, well, you could make the argument Chris didn't even show love, support, gratitude, or willingness to help himself. So how could Chris understand these concepts in terms of trying to show them to his own parents? But what do you expect? It, 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 it may goes to show that Chris's level of narcissism was far deeper than we had any reason to think. Reinforcing Bob's point, Chris still ran for his father's aid when he felt threatened as in the later parts of the Casey and Liquid call. Despite Bob's occasional frustration over Chris's actions, he seemed to have brought into the theory that Chris is a tormented by a complex network of enemies spanning the entire world. Due to the success that he has earned from his own Sonic franchise, in the Matthew Noble call, it appeared that Bob was the source of Chris's tendency to bring up unrelated mishaps and debacles to make current incidents and sources of stress seem petty in comparison. Fortunately, Matthew Noble, which was just Alec Benson Leary, was not playing ball with this, 
which is what you do. And this is something that no and other people have done throughout is that you don't play into these delusions. Once during a phone call with a troll, Bob stated that Chris was a hell of a lot nicer and has done a lot better than the troll calling him. Yeah, I don't... Uh, I, I mean, I suppose you could say uh, Bob was just trying to defend his son's honor, but it's not like Chris wasn't completely inept at fighting his own battles. Sometimes. After, well, 10% of the time. After Chris got his now obsolete CAD degree, instead of telling Chris to get to work like any other parent would, he encouraged Chris to stay home just so he could continue to get his taxpayer-funded tugboat. As to why Mr. C even suggested the idea of going to college at all, that's kind of another point. If if the whole point was just to get Chris on, you know, welfare, then what was even the point of sending him to college? He never seemed to get past the notion that Chris could and had already achieved things, given that he continued to have to nursemaid Chris well into his son's late twenties. In the later parts of the two thousand of two thousand nine and throughout twenty ten, as chronicled in Chris's emails with Vivian G and Jackie, Bob had been forced to take an increasingly active role in controlling Chris's spending and debt, paying off Chris's credit cards with his own money in an attempt to prevent interest charges from spiralling even further out of control. By the fall of 2010, he was motioning Chris, monitoring Chris's bank accounts on a daily basis and keeping him on a strict allowance. Upon finding out about Chris's escapades in early 2011, Bob's reaction was to question Chris's sexuality, at one point even calling him the F-A-G word. Even though he indirectly contributed it to through his unbalanced approach of socialising Chris. Chris has said specifically that he doesn't have to love his father but has to respect him. Confidential details collected after Bob's death, however, suggest Chris was more emotionally attached than he let on providing rare and precious evidence that Chris doesn't take the presence of others for granted. He also got genuinely emotional while reading a letter that his father had left him on camera, again indicating how much he misses his father. We might possibly watch that video in a, in a separate one, but there are some... I, I, I like to imagine Chris does, it's just the way Chris shows it, or the way that... Uh, I've said before... You can gauge a lot for what some people really think by what they don't say as opposed to what they do say, but we'll cover that when we get to it. In December 2012, Chris uploaded the soundtrack from the 1990 WTJU Jazz Marathon, in which Bob was a performer and a host. It was notable as one of the few moments where Chris publicly honoured his father's memory since his passing in September 2011. Bob lives on in his son's memory. Chris noted the occasion of his father's passing by attaching angel wings to the Lego minifigure representing him, that's generally quite sweet, and displaying two photos of him in front of his TV. He often sees Bob in his dreams. Due to the influence of the idea guys, Chris later expressed beliefs that Bob is half Sonichu and is apparently still alive in Quickfield Dimension. These beliefs began around December 2017, and continued even after the idea guys had been removed from power, as shown by the below quote from 2018's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to each and every father in this world, and in every single other dimension too. My father is alive again. I still love him, even in his trokey patted glory. You know what, say, say what you will about the idea guys, but... I will say this about Chris is that actually this was genuinely quite a quite a sweet thing to do to be honest although given the shape of Bob's trousers it looks like his his butt is sort of like sticking forwards and where you know it should be behind him but again it's it, it is what it is I'm it's it that it's actually quite one of the most one of, one of the sweeter moments that Chris has actually had in his life in the incest call, Chris claimed he was better at pleasing Bob than his own father, and we immediately go straight to this after all the nice things I said about this. One can only imagine Bob's reaction to the news if he were still alive. Despite his best efforts to the contrary, Chris could easily be considered Bob's biggest failure as a parent, even when factoring in his strained relationship with his other children. Maybe so, but I want people to understand. People may say that 
yes, absolutely, that's true. But I will also say is that what about the things that well, Chris, Chris is Chris is still his own person. His actions are still his own, and whether Bob or the Quickie like it or not, Bob, Chris did what Chris does, and there were the idea guys were not influencing. Uh, uh, Chris during this time the TT squad were not influencing this no was not influencing this Gibby was not influencing this Dylan Thomas was not influencing this I certainly wasn't influencing any of this this was something that Chris had been saying for years and just said fuck it and did it other relationships in spite of his redneck background Bob seems to have gotten better with foreigners than with his own countrymen his closest friend in Richmond was Reverend Chen of the Korean uh, Canaan uh, Prebiterian -bi -pre Church. And he had English friends, uh, though his involvement with Matt's British pub. He also had friends in Australia. From his father's second marriage, Bob had a large number of half-brothers and sisters in Salem, North Carolina. But he does not seem to have been very close with them. Bob's stepmother's obituary confirms that eight of these half-siblings were alive as of 2015. Contrary to popular beliefs, he did not have friends in the Ku Klux Klan. Well, thank God for that, I suppose. Later life, poor health, and death. Bob lived on Social Security as well as his general electric pension. He never really had people to chat with at home. He would ramble to total strangers on the phone if he could, so he sat around, listened to music, and took care of the garden inside the greenhouse. With a 1970s stereo system set up in the greenhouse, he went to swing with the music on his swing there. Bob had two triple bypasses and four heart attacks. The two triple bypasses operations took place first in August 1980 and at last in 1992. He had coronial artery disease and wore an artificial pacemaker. He apparently had several vivid near-death experiences. During Chris's date with Emily, Bob tells her that he has died several times, and Chris says that Bob has seen the light but did not actually go to it. In one prank call, Bob revealed after surgery for cancer, it was discovered that he had a fluid buildup in his legs, which is symptomatic of CHF. This rapid decline in health worried him. He attributed his long life to the Cherokee in him, his uh, un his un uncles and a grandfather all all lived past ninety. His uncles. I, I don't know why that was so hard to say. It. Eh. Despite his heart troubles, he continued to eat at Burger King daily. Hmm. Maybe this is something Burger King should probably have advertised. If you eat with us, you could live to well, well into in, in, into you could. If you eat at Burger King, you could probably get the telegram from the king. On the first of March, two thousand ten, Chris tweeted that Bob had been taken to the hospital in the early morning for congested heart failure. Chris seemed confident that his father was not in for a long stay, considering Bob's age, lifestyle, and long history of heart disease. Chris did not seem to grasp the seriousness of his heart failure. Bob had been the only thing keeping the Chandler household from imploding, and as such, trolls and white knights alike wished him for the best. I I know as well. That's it's it's so bizarre. Like it, even in this period, it's like you have to understand is that they were most of them there were just to toy around with Chris. They absolutely wanted no harm to come to Bob. Bob was. As far, well, wasn't completely innocent, but was the innocent in in all of this, you could say. Outside of, you know, other people who had absolutely nothing to do with this, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> in the month following uh, Bob's hospitalization, Chris was remarkably quiet on the subject of his father. News about his condition was hard to come by as information only arose when Chris was inclined to complain about it online. Statistically, congestive heart failure is not as immediately fatal as it, its name implies, but Bob's age, prior heart attacks, and lifestyle made this a very serious situation. Chris's videos over the month of March made no mention of Bob at all. Staying true to his painfully uh, predictable nature, Chris instead lost a girlfriend he never had, made racial slurs and death threats towards a cartoon character, and raged against abstinence. 
His silence on the subject of his father was probably because of genuine ignorance of the seriousness of his father's condition. That, as well as the fact that I think it was probably Chris might have had the foreknowledge to know that it was based on uh, Barbara's story with colitis. It probably wasn't a good idea to spread around this sort of information online. Uh, and unless, of course, somebody because somebody would have probably done something stupid and accused uh, Chris whether or not his dad had AIDS as well. A poster on Quick contacted Chris via the PSN regarding Bob. He posted a screen capture of Chris's response saying, He is doing much better. Thank you. Another contacted Chris via email and got a response saying, Yes, my father is healthy and safe. Clearly he was neither, but this was at least proof that Bob had enjoyed the whites only section of heaven just yet. In late May, Chris finally made a brief mention in a public video that his father was live and well. Chris was at least half right. A breakdown of Bob's final months reads as follows. The 24th of March 2011, Bob claimed in a phone call to have cancer of some description. On the 23rd of April 2011, in an email to Jackie, Chris revealed that Bob had received surgery for colon cancer. On the 20th of July 2011, it was revealed that Bob knew about Chris's cross-dressing tendencies and, like Bob, vehemently disapproved of them. On the 29th of August 2011, Chris, now deeply entrenched in his tongue girlish ways, mentioned that Bob was an ill and sickly shut-in and was suffering from feet bloatings. I don't know if this is like uh, a, an, early, a, an early sign of, you know, gangrene or something like that, but we might not know. We don't even know if it was even a result of of uh, Bob being in his uh, greenhouse most of the time or not. In early September 2011, Bob was rushed by ambulance to Martha Jefferson Ho Hospital with heart failure. It was discovered later that Bob had been put into quarantine when he arrived because his body was covered in bug bites and he posed a contamination risk. On the 6th of that month, he died at age 84. Out of respect for him and his family, the quickie was closed for a week, from the 12th to the 19th of September, with the start date coinciding with the day Bob's funeral service was held. Site visitors were directed to a page which simply read, Robert Franklin Chandler Jr., 1927-2011. to It is said that Marvin, the guy in the pickle suit, and other trolls using the Jackie identity as a catfish, attempted to contact Chris over the phone shortly after Bob's death for unclear reasons. Chris was noted to be audibly upset as he cried throughout the conversation. While the audio was recorded and archived on what is referred to as the black tape by some Christorians, the contents of the call were never released publicly due to Chris's miserable emotional state. The trolls who participated in the call realised after the fact that it was simply too soon to try to reach out to Chris in this fashion and, for a change, opted to respect his privacy for once. The black tape either still exists in the hands of the trolls who participated in its creation, or it has been lost to time. That's probably one of the most tactful things you could say the trolls have, like, ever done, is the fact that they decided that, no, l l like, for all the bad things Chris has done, he is still human at the end of the day, and whether Chris wanted to acknowledge this or not, it was, a, it must have been a, an incredibly traumatic event. And one that probably Chris, no matter how much he tried to sway it off, was just not prepared for. Bob's death also marked another significant change in Chris's life, as the vast majority of the trolls associated with the classic era voluntarily retired from trolling Chris, knowing that he was deeply depressed by his father's passing. Only a few of these trolls still remain active as observers on the Kiwi farms, and a trolling renaissance did not begin until much later in the decade with the advent of the idea guys. The cause of death. Despite the fairly clear-cut nature of the lumberjack's passing, Chris has since declared that the trolls were responsible for Bob's death. I don't really know how... In an email leaked on the 22nd of March 2014, Chris claimed that the stress of his trolling led to Bob's heart attack. This keeps in the trend Chris has developed of blaming any and all misfortunes, even those faced by everyone, like burying a family member on the trolls. It's, uh, uh, and the total stress killed my father prematurely. If not for those trolls, he would still be alive and would likely have been a lot lived 
beyond 2015. Which, as we know, is just straight up ludicrous. Chris seems to have never have heard the proverb before that there is no armour against fate. And why would why would it even matter if Bob had lived to 2015? This just seems to suggest that Chris, that he could continue living in blissful ignorance whilst his father was... He, it's the point that Chris didn't even think that it was important to even make enough time with Chris. It, Chris should have known better that when his father needs to go to hospital for heart failure, that this was like a very... This was a, a, an incredibly serious incident. Like, this is the sort of thing that Chris should have been by his father's side each and every step. Chris should have just known better to spend time with his dad. That's just what Chris... That's, that's, that's the sort of thing that I would have just done. I, I wouldn't need to think about letting other people know. I should... You, you just get on with it. Because there are some things in life, ladies and gentlemen, where you don't need to explain yourself. You just do it. Simple as that. If this had happened to my dad, I wouldn't be making a post saying that I, I can't uh, do any videos right now because of a family emergency. I would leave that for now. If people were concerned, then I would appreciate it, but I would have addressed it when things had been sorted. That It's, 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 it's as simple as that, and I don't need to justify myself when it comes to um, looking after my family's well-being. That's just, <clears throat> that's just as it goes. Even for Chris, this is appalling behaviour. Using the death of his own father as a vehicle to play the victim and attempt to stave off trolls. While it's not uncommon for those who have lost loved ones to blame their deaths on external causes, however imp impossible or insane, as in this case, Chris's actions stem purely from selfishness and egotism, business as usual. Years later, in 2017, Chris revised his claim and said that Bob was killed after hospital staffed surprised him with a loud noise. He went on to say that he had more freedom when Bob was alive. I wish I could go back to September 5th, 2011 and stop the staff from making the loud noise that killed my father with stressful surprise. I had more freedom when he was alive. And what did Chris do with the freedom when his father was alive? Mostly by falling into traps with trolls, getting into fake relationships and isolating himself as much as he possibly could, not only from people in real life, but people on the internet, and from any prospect whatsoever of Chris getting a real job or anything in between. Obituary. Both Bob and Chris collaborated in writing Bob's obituary, which was published in two local papers, Main points of the obituary, apart from the standard birth date, date of birth, and next of kin include text going into unusual detail about what Bob did at General Electric, the location of the memorial service to follow on a later date at Wesley Memorial United Methodist Church, the church that Bob, Bob, and Chris used to frequent together, this is the same church that Rocky Shoemaker con consoled Chris from, a footnote asking readers to not donate flowers but to donate money to Barbara and Chris, with Chris taking part in writing the obituary, it's amazing that the writing stayed focused on Bob and did not once mention Sonichu or become about Chris, except for the request for money at the end. But, yeah, the original text. Robert Franklin Chandler Jr., 84, of Ruckersville, passed away the morning of Tuesday, September 6, 2011, at Martha Jefferson Hospital, ICU, surrounded by family, pastor, and hospital staff. He was born on September 4, 1927, in Texas, the son of the late Robert Franklin Chandler Sr. and Jean Holloman Chandler. On June 7, 1980, he married Barbara Ann Weston, who survives, and the couple gave birth to a son, Christian Weston Chandler, who survives. Also surviving is ex-wife Patricia and their shared children, son, Dr. David Allen Chandler Jr., who survives, and daughter Carol Suzanne Chandler, survives. He graduated from Auburn University with a degree in engineering. He served in the United States Army uh, uh, South Korea in the Signal Corps during the Korean War. He worked for General Electric as an engineer with steels, plastics, etc. He also had patents for the controls of plastic molding machines. Without him, we would not have had a simple plastic funnel. Also surviving are granddaughter Savannah Chandler, 
the daughter of David Anlon Chandler and his wife Kimberly. A funeral service will be held at Monticello Memory Gardens in Charlottesville, Virginia, 10 a.m. Monday, September 12, 2011. A memorial service to follow on a later date at Wesley Memorial United Methodist Church. Instead of flowers, you may make monetary donations to his widow, Barbara Chandler, and son, Christian Chandler. In Memoriam Bob is often seen as a uh, gregarious, hard-working man, all things considered, who tried, albeit without success, his best to refine Chris into someone that could at least pass for a reasonable adult. Or responsible. Pick, uh, choose, pick your poison. Given his mock job interviews and chaperoning him on dates, where he proved, unsurprisingly, more adept at charming the dates than Chris, but stopped altogether in his later years, leaving Chris to his own devices. On the other hand, we have to him to thank for some of his son's more backward worldviews. He managed to alternate his other children enough that his daughter didn't attend his funeral or keep in touch while he was alive. He helped Chris to construct bizarre conspiracy theories to justify trespassing and the like. Among other things, he, like Barbara, enabled Chris crippling dependence on them, general immaturity and irresponsibility, and his myriad of other flaws. He bowled out his son repeatedly, or bailed out his son, I should say, and never really let Chris experience the consequences of his misinformed life decisions. He never made any serious effect to correct his son's glaring character flaws and shortcomings, even when he caught him masturbating in the kitchen. The few times he did intervene, it wasn't even for Chris's own benefit, but to shake off the trolls and the health department. He also did not make any attempt to provide for Chris's future, beyond ensuring the tugboat. He left all his money to Barbara, who promptly wasted it all on lawyer fees. A conscientious parent would have anticipated this and put some money of some of the money in a trust for Chris. Not that Chris would have handled the money any better. While some like to remember Bob as a kind-hearted man who tried his best to be a good father, others see him as a uh, remnant of a bygone era who is responsible for moulding Chris into the person he is today. Chris's beliefs on Bob's afterlife. Idea guy influences. Robert Franklin Chandler Jr. and Ted Bundy Souls never went to heaven or hell. They both became reborn as their respective sonichu forms. Mr. C and Ted also served to help the nation of Quickville in defense and intellect. Yes, you are hearing that correctly. Apparently, Chan uh, Bob Chandler and Ted Bundy somehow got along in C1 in Quickville. And Chris believes this. During the Idea Guy saga, Chris's belief in multiple dimensions was exploited and his sense of reality hijacked to make changes to many of Chris's characters, concepts and perspectives of the real world, with him considering them to all be valid. Perhaps one of the more heinous examples of this was the Idea Guy's manipulation of Chris's views of his own father, views from which Chris has yet to abandon despite the Idea Guys being removed from power by the Guard Dogs in mid-2018. Ideas involving Bob include Bob's spirit resides in Quickville, Dimension C-197, as a half sonichu named Robert Chu, styled in his sonichu form as a beaver with uh, checkerboard uh, fur, a reference to his troll-given internet lumberjack nickname. Bob met serial killer Ted Bundy while in Quickville and helps defend it alongside Ted, Post-idea guys, Chris decided that Robert Chu's fur colour was really red with black ears because he found it too time-consuming to draw the checkerboard pattern. Robert Chu was featured as cards in Chris's homemade ship thick uh, expansion. In one, Chris photoshopped a photo of Barbara so that she is standing beside a drawing of Robert Chu in his sonichu form. The card text reads, Honey, I'm home, and states, Every once in a while, Mr. C runs back home to offer comfort to Barbara. Before the dimension merge is completion, she has missed him every day, and found the solace and comfort when he comes by. He continues to carry a torch for her in his heart and soul, while he helps to protect everyone in Quickville and at this old temple of a house. If that's what Chris chooses to call it, and yes, this is how Chris decided to do it. With Barbara, like, 
not really sure how to take this in in that way. Appearances in Sonichu. Christian, you are not a girl. Go put your pants back on. What a quote, eh? In Spring Break 2008, a radio announcement from Jams to Sonichu mentions that Bob founded Quickville in 1982, presumably after Chris's birth on the 24th of February. Given that Bob named the city after his newborn son, Comic Bob presumably served as mayor before Chris took the office at an unknown date. At other points, Bob was mentioned in Chris's tangents about hating men other than himself and his father. In Date Ed, there are two dolls for the class to participate and practice talking to. Chris rece girls received Robert dolls, while boys received Barbara dolls, an obvious reference homage to both Bob and Bob. Cute and novel in some cases, but later on proves very deeply disturbing. Bob made his first official appearance in Sonic 2 issue 11, photoshopped into a family photo alongside Chris, Bob and various electronic Pokemon. In Sonic 2 issue 12, Bob appears in a set of pages that combine an autobiographical account of Chris coming out as a Tongo to his parents, and a tribute to his late father. He is depicted as an elderly man, as the page uh, took place in 2010, Due to Chris's odious complex, Bob is depicted as much more youthful. He attempts to dissuade Chris from continuing his Tongo lifestyle, although Chris states that Bob later told me he accepts and loved me for who I am, shortly before his passing in 2011. Chris concludes Bob's appearance in the book with a photo in memoriam of his life, saying that he and Bob continue to miss him every day. In August 2017, Chris unveiled a drawing of the Chandler family depicted as My Little Pony characters, saying that they will make further appearances in Sonichu 12-9. The ponified Bob, known as Gallop Crush, appears as Nightstar's father, reaffirming the self-insert nature of Chris's pony Sona. In the idea guy written Sonichu issue 16, Bob's spirit crosses over into Quickville, where he meets and strikes up a conversation with serial killer Ted Bundy. And among other things, this is like Chris uh, making uh, Bob as a toy, uh, well, as an amiibo, I should say. And here is a list of videos that, and audio calls that Chris, well, that Bob featured in all throughout his time. And as you can see right here, this was uh, Bob as a freshman in uh, 1950, 51 in his senior yearbook photo and this is again all about his draft cards uh, from when he was in the army, his marriage licenses, his divorce, the census of both Bob and his parents from 1930-1940, Chris's family tree, Chris later in life, uh, presumably when Chris, was o when Chris was only a couple of years old and much later in life with Bob, Chris and Bob in 1993 with Aunt Karina and an article briefly mentioned in 1997 and this is the uh, the least known photo apparently which is presumably one of the last ones as well and a couple of uh, tribute videos were also made to uh, to Bob as well to be honest if 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 none of these feet if this doesn't feature the song "Hurt" by Johnny Cash, I, I'll see it anyway. But just to let you know, uh, "Hurt" is if it by the time I, my time comes to an end, and if somebody made a tribute video about me, I I would I would love more than anything to have the song "Hurt" by Johnny Cash being played because it's just about one of the greatest songs ever written. But I suppose we could take a brief look. That's well, I will say is I'll just say as well, it's. Good on the people for actually doing it because it just goes to show you that just it was in the best interest of people to actually make tributes to someone who even at the at the best of times uh, Bob was only trying to do what he felt was best. It may not have been for the best but you can't blame Bob for trying which is just about the most you could say for 
any parent who is struggling to raise uh, a child like Chris. But for what they are, ladies and gentlemen, I if if Bob was looking it wherever Bob is right now, it's there's probably no doubt he would be very very disappointed in his son because of recent events, and that, as they say, is that. And I hope all of you guys have learned something from uh, this article on Bob Chandler. And I cannot wait to see all of you guys again in the next video. Take care and bye-bye for now.